pray in the name of Jesus that that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall speak through me, shall quicken my mortal body and quicken the mortal body of your people. Oh God, that these words that I speak, they shall be spirit and life to your people. Thank you for answered prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Hallelujah. Well, we are getting to the finishing line and some of us are happy <laughs> that we can end our work. Amen. It's been a marathon, not from here. We brought our tiredness from Ghana. But it is well. Amen. Um, I want to encourage you to get these CDs and DVDs. And I want to say that they are not any form of private business or personal enrichment program. Amen. But everything or anything that comes out of this goes to the women's ministry and the work that is being done. Amen. Amen. But I think that even though this was preached at a pastor's wife's convention, there were many ladies present who were not pastors or ministers' wives because there's nothing new under the sun. And there were many ladies also not from Lighthouse who attended this conference. So I want to encourage you to get the messages, the sin of Vashti. You see, sometimes you say, oh, but I've heard it before, but even I know that God always brings a different dimension to what, something that is preached. Types of women, not all women are the same. Amen. The Bible said about Mary, blessed are you amongst women. So we are all women, but there are different types. Contentious women, gracious women, virtuous women, brawling women, different types, types of women. Okay? And then, remedies for contention. You find out that there's always, you know, somebody said to me, Lady Pastor, my main problem in my marriage is continual strife. How do you deal with strife? Every time there's no peace. And the Bible says it's better to dwell in the corner of a house than with a contentious woman. And that sacrifices of ox and all that in a place of strife, you rather leave it and go and stay in the desert. That's what the Bible says. So, since homes are made by the wisdom of women and destroyed by their foolishness, it's important to know how you can overcome contention in your home. Sometimes from you, sometimes from your spouse, sometimes even from your children. So I'll encourage you to get that message. Then, love not the world. The sin of familiarity. When you are so familiar with the anointing, with your husband, and all that, and some people come to church and they cannot receive from their husband who is preaching because of the sin of familiarity. This message will give you a key. And when we walk in familiarity, we lose out on what God wants to do. Amen. Because Mikal did not even join the people to dance. This one is not about Mikal anyway. But she didn't join. When the ark of God was coming, everybody was dancing and celebrating. She was not there. She was standing afar off. And idleness brings what? Criticism. So she was able to criticize because of that. And a host of questions. And in this question and answer time, we also did what you like about your husband. Because some people could not find any. So it was a homework for them to find. And some people were called forward to tell us what they celebrate in their marriages. So you hear all that. And you people, you like filler. It's all... <laughs> on the CD. And some of the women said very daring things about their husbands. So I love my husband because he's a very passionate lover and so many other things. So buy this and you will be blessed. Amen. There are also a host of other CDs. You know, most of the time, even in the question and answer time, you find out as a pastor that the preaching has solved a lot of the problems. But we don't want to listen, we don't want to read, we don't want to sit down and glean what has been shared with us, you know. So, these days I've learned, when I'm talking to people, I, I talk to you, I realize that it's only 10 minutes. 
But what you really need is to sit under a certain word that the Holy Spirit has brought and that will change your life. So yesterday as I spoke to people, I said, you, your own is remedies to contention. A woman of understanding, because you don't have understanding. So get all these and it will help you. Because as I counsel you, it's just a short while. So please, let's invest in the word. We invest in weave on. We invest in shoes. We will go, we will travel interstate to find something. So travel interstate to find the word of God and be blessed. Amen. This morning is our end. Amen. We are crowning everything. I want to thank all of you, those who have hosted people. Thank you for opening up your homes to us. Because when you open up your home to somebody, the person sees things that normally, if it were just you and your wife, you wouldn't see. And the person wouldn't see. Amen. For instance, the person sees when you, when you eat breakfast, how you face your children, how your children speak to you. So many things that when we are in church, we won't see. But you opened your homes anyway. May the Lord bless you and reward you openly. Amen. Once somebody went somewhere and was telling me, you know, in her, in her house she does this. In her house she does so. The person's only mistake was to have opened her home to you. She shouldn't have shown you that kindness. Because suddenly you have a whole book and then you are talking. She apologizes. So, this is my mother. I said, she apologizes for letting you into her life. You know, so it's not a small thing to host people. So God bless you. Those of you who fed them, those of you who starved them, God bless you anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. And those of you who prayed behind the scenes, the engine room for this meeting, may the Lord remember you. Prayer warriors are not seen. Amen. Preachers are seen, but prayer warriors are not seen. But prayers are what the preacher stands on to be able to launch out so, as I often say, may the Lord who sees his secret reward you. Those who did all the running around, those who helped the children know how to dance, what to do, those of you who were faced incessantly, may the Lord bless you. <laughs> Amen. All the friction and all the quarrels, let them cease. Let daughter be a unifying factor instead of a factor of division. In the name of Jesus. And let's show the world that women can also unite and do something and that it can work. Amen. Those who sold cloth. You see, so many things happen. Martha ministry, Hannah ministry, doctors. You don't know. A lot of things have happened to make this uh, program a success. So God bless us all. And you know, we can never repay him. God will always give you more than you have given. Those who have given to the orphans, to the primary school projects, the geos, the pastors. Thank you for leaving your churches to be here with us. We are blessed. The sons, thank you for believing in us. And thank you for standing with us. Amen. God bless you. And above all, we thank our Heavenly Father for all the great things that he has done. I have been very well treated in America. Thank you very much. And God bless you. A new day is dawning. Amen, Rachel. <laughs> this morning, I want to speak about the weapon of love. Amen. On Friday, I shared with you about our weapons being not carnal, but being mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself above the knowledge of God. And I'm saying that the weapons that God gives us are not the weapons that the world uses. The world is, every nation is always trying to gain supremacy over another. You know, sometimes another nation is invading another nation, like during the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein just decided one morning that he would march on Kuwait and just an annex them because they were too small. Between Nigeria and Cameroon, there's a major fight over some border disputes and because that place is oil rich the un has ruled president obasanjo has signed nigerians now say they don't agree with president obasanjo's decision <laughs> so what is i mean what is law 
You know, and there's so much conflict in the world because man wants to exert power. Dictators want to stay in power. People want to perpetuate their reign. So many things. They are, you, Africa is poor, but we are always importing major weapons. We don't have money, but recently a whole shipload of uh, um, weapons was going to Zimbabwe from China. And it was found out and then they deflected, but they, they got to Zimbabwe and they, did, they were not allowed into South Africa, but they got there anyway. What I'm trying to say is that man wants to win war so much that we will invest so much more than food. We invest so much into weapons and fighting and war more than food because of conflict and fighting and these kind of things. But you know, Jesus gave us other weapons. On Friday, we saw the weapon of good counsel. I told you that last year in Atlanta, I preached about the weapon of stillness. And today, I want to talk about the weapon of love. Hallelujah. So let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans is in the New Testament, please. We are not talking about the people who come from Rome. Romans chapter 12. Hallelujah. Verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. Hallelujah. Now the Bible says that be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Devotion means commitment. Devotion means not wavering. Devotion means keeping at it. So with brotherly love, it's saying that be devoted. Keep at it. Don't give up where brotherly love is concerned. And give preference to one another in honor. We think that we should only honor those in authority. But the Bible says, give preference and honor one another. It also says, recompense no man evil for evil. Amen. Amen. The NASB says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. As much as lies within you, be at peace. With all men, cantankerous men, difficult men, inconsiderate men and women. Men is gender neutral, okay? I went for a course. I said, nowadays, you know, the Bible has, and God created man, and, and like this, like honor all men. They said, now they want to write a new Bible and make it gender neutral. So, men and women, he or she, and God called he or she. And God said, hey, it's not a simple thing. <laughs> Amen. But the Bible says that when somebody does you evil, don't pay back. Amen. Because we have the tendency to want to pay back. Leave room for the wrath of God. Say, beloved. He's talking not to unbelievers. Christian said, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself or don't seek your own revenge or don't seek to settle scores yourself or don't seek um, to punish people yourself or don't seek to have a reward and punishment system uh, regulating your relationships. So avenge not yourself, but give place to the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine. I hear somebody said, vengeance is mine. And I will repay, says the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Vengeance is mine. And I will repay, says the Lord. So vengeance is mine, but the repayment is God's. Another person said that when Jesus was on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The reason why he said that was because he could not forgive. So he asked the Heavenly Father to do it. Father, 
forgive them for them you can forgive them but they are very bad i cannot forgive them interpretation of the words amen the bible says avenge not yourself god give place to the wrath of god vengeance is mine and i will repay says the lord but if your enemy is hungry feed him the first thing is if your enemy is hungry how will you even know because usually you keep your distance if your enemy is hungry you usually say you should go to hell you should do what you like if your enemy is hungry feed him if he's thirsty give him a drink try not to put poison in it <laughs> for in so doing you will heap coals of fire you see some of you would like to take a literal or literal coals of fire to put on people's heads and you we have so much a spirit of revenge and god is saying that when you feel like that rather let the kind acts of love be those coals of fire and he said do not be overcome with evil because evil can easily overcome you when people betray you offend you there are some way and sometimes we also forget that we are also some way and all that and you feel that no if I continue to forgive them, they will take advantage of me. But I have to show them, what do they say? Where power lies. But it says, do not be overcome by evil. But the way to conquer this war is to overcome evil with good. Hallelujah. And I want you to come with me to see somebody in whose life love was manifest. First Samuel verse 24. Chapter 24, sorry. First Samuel chapter 24 before we even come to 24 we have to see the genesis of it 18 okay first samuel is in the old testament please verse 8 then saul became very angry for this saying displeased him and he said they have ascribed to david ten thousands but to me they have ascribed thousands now what more can he have but the kingdom and saul eyed david with suspicion from that day on now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand as usual and a spear was in Saul's hand and Saul held the spear for he thought if I will pin David to the wall but David escaped from his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid for, of David for the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul therefore Saul removed him from his presence and appointed him as his commander of a thousand and he went out and came in before the people and David was prospering in all his ways for the Lord was with him when Saul saw that he was prospering greatly he dreaded him but all Israel and Judah loved David and he went out and came in before them then Saul said to David here is my older daughter Merab I'll give her to you as a wife only be a valiant man for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, my hand shall not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. But Saul said to, David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? So it came about at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel the Meholathite for a wife. Now Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David, when they told Saul the thing was agreeable to him and Saul thought I will give her to him that she may become a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him therefore Saul said to David for a second time you may be my son-in-law today then Saul commanded his servants speak to David secretly behold the king delights in you and all his servants love you now therefore become the sins the king's son-in-law so Saul's servants spoke these words to David but David said is it trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law since I'm a poor man and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul reported him according to these words which David so spoke. Saul then said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry except a hundred false kings of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David to become the king's son-in-law before the days had expired. 
David rose up and went, he and his men, and struck down 200 men among the Philistines. Then David brought their false kings and gave them in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. So Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, for a wife. When Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, then Saul was even more afraid of David, that Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines went out to battle. And it happened as often as they went out that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul. So his name was highly esteemed. Hallelujah. Now, Saul did not start off hating David. He brought David to his palace because the Bible says the Lord pleased him. But when David had finished killing Goliath, at a point even Jesse sent for David again, David went home and then would come and all that. And then at a point he became part of the palace. And when that happened, the women came out singing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Just now that David came, he has slain ten thousands. And Saul who has been king, for some time winning the wars against different people has slain thousands and women have a knack for flattery and for speaking things that are not true and then we stir up things that in the end does not help hallelujah the first trait of a strange woman in both proverbs 5 and proverbs 7 is that her lips drop as smooth as oil and her words are like the honeycomb and in Proverbs chapter 7 or 8, the Bible says about the strange woman, do not be taken in by her words. And sometimes it's our joy that makes us give the flattery. And unfortunately, it's the lack and need of a man and his ego to be wrapped and to be massaged. And so we speak the things. And then later, it brings problems. But when Saul was told that, he should have recognized that it is not the woman who made him king. He was just walking somewhere looking for camels or donkeys. When God said, this is the man that I've chosen, go and look for him and anoint him. But instead of recognizing where you have come from, you begin to look at your environment and what is happening around you. Hallelujah. And so... He said, if they have ascribed the kingdom to David, what else would they give to him? But these are not kingmakers. These are not people with clout. These are not people with authority. But you fear things that you should not fear. And that leads to conflict in relationships. The Bible says, fear him who after killing you has power to cast you into hell. But we fear people who are totally powerless. And we are so concerned about their comments. And we meditate upon it day and night as if they are God. Who saith a thing and it cometh to pass when the Lord has not decreed it. You were walking somewhere and someone called you. Put oil. You became another man. You began to prophesy. That's the power of God. Why is that the supernatural power of God? But suddenly, you say, oh, if they've ascribed this to David, then they will also give him the kingdom. What is the source of your power? Who is the source of your blessing? So jealousy and envy and all that, they're just creeping without our seeing. And from that day, Saul eyed David. The New American Standard Bible says, Saul looked at him suspiciously. And now David, poor David has to go and play the harp in the presence of Saul. And as he's playing the harp to drive out your own evil spirits, you also have a spear and you are throwing that spear at him but David didn't say some of us as soon as one spear comes we say brother I would like to tender my resignation <laughs> this is the end of it as soon as we have an offense in the church one spear we say sister you know something I was at peace before I joined the church since I joined the church many conflicts I want peace let me just step aside but David did not do that one spear came, he dodged. Another spear came, he dodged. 
and he did not leave the presence of a king. Why? Because he knew that it was God who had set him there and not man. And that was the difference between he and Saul and their thinking at the moment. And as you go through life, spears and daggers and swords and knives will be thrown at you. You must be wise enough to dodge. But it doesn't mean you should leave the palace. For in the time that when God is ready to make you king, you will not know the graces of the palace because you did not stay there to be nurtured and prepared by God. Hallelujah. It's not time yet to go and dwell in caves and dens. And I think that David had a perfect heart because even to know whether Saul wanted to kill him, he's now asking Jonathan, okay, find out from your father. And if your father says this, I feel that it's obvious. As soon as you throw the spear, I say, you are an evil person. You are a very bad person. You are not somebody to be trusted. I will know immediately. But he had such a pure heart that even when spears are being thrown, he just feels that maybe that's not what it means. For the Bible says, love believes the best about everybody. Amen. The Bible says, love believes all things. Amplified says, love is prepared to believe the best. When you have a choice, should I believe the evil about this person or the good? Choose the good because love believes the best about everybody. Amen. And when David comes in, the Bible says, Saul is afraid of him. Sometimes people resent you, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. The fact that God is with you, you didn't come and say, put me here. Do this to me. But just where you are and what you stand for, people are just, they can't flow. Amen. 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 Once, you know, I, I thought I had done something to somebody's car just by driving by. And then I sent people to tell the person, because they were in service, that after church service, I will solve your problem for you. But the anger of the lady was not commensurate with what had happened. Her bonnet had fallen. I mean, something, you know, and the witch was huffing and puffing. I didn't, and I had said that I'll fix it. So I came and I said, calm down, I'll fix it. And the people said, oh, it's the first lady. If she says that she'll fix it. First lady, and so what? As soon as I heard that, I knew that it's not what I've done, but who I am. That is the problem. Hallelujah. And so I sent people to see what was wrong. And even after all the huffing and puffing, some clip or whatever on a golf had come off. So you just hook it. That's what had happened. And it wasn't that, I mean, a major something had happened. So after that, they fixed it for us. Eh, I'm going. I mean, she didn't even come to see. You know, sometimes you are ashamed. So you just <laughs> go away. But I was telling somebody, and the person said, Ah, she, pa, why should she say that? I know her. I even know where she lives. I'm going to face her fully for you. Why should he? So some people took and take people's quarrels <laughs> and fight them for you. And then I said, You know, one thing I've learned in ministry is that people who have a lot of problems are very difficult people to live with. And the reason why is that they are frustrated. Something is not going on well. So it's really not about you. It's about their own frustration that they have come to church with. Hallelujah. But there's no understanding in the body of Christ. It's frustration. And perhaps with Saul also, God had told him, I've ripped the kingdom from you. I'll give it to another. The Philistines were coming. A lot of pressure. So now he's looking out for, who is it? Can it be you? Because so when they sang the song, he said, hey, they've given the kingdom. Insecurity. But it's not about you in particular, but it's just about the situation. And then the sister said to me, well, what you may be saying may be right because for many weeks, this woman has been sitting at the back every time she's weeping. This woman who faced me, every time she's weeping, I said, you see, so I am sure that there's something wrong. And even when I had a window into her life, I saw that things were bizarre and it wasn't easy. So I think that when the person sits back, and sees you. You come and sit in front. You smile. People always say, I look stress-free. I ask them, well, how should I look? I don't know how stressed people look. You know? I said, no, but I'm hot. I mean, it's a convention. I'm hot. There are stresses of life. So what should I do? They said, you don't look. So how do you look? Do you understand? It's not an effort to cover anything. I'm genuinely being myself, and I'm genuinely hot. 
But when they say they can't see, how what I should do for them to see, to get their sympathy in what I do. But I learned that is frustration. Because even in my own life, sometimes my children, they come and you are dealing with your own issues. It's not them. Either your money is finished, you are angry with something. And I say, would you put that cup down? The shouting does not warrant what the child is doing. But it's because you have your own set of problems. Hallelujah. And you are just looking for somebody to direct that missile to. And I think that the same thing was happening in Saul's life. But as he saw David, like I said, no, he's prospering too much. And he was afraid of him. So he decided to send him away. So he said, go and be a commander of the army. Your life must be in jeopardy. Go away. And as David went away, the Bible says that he rather pleased the people. And the people loved him. And he went in and out of the people. And the Saul said, no, things are working too much. I'm not happy. You see, give your enemy the chance to do over time. But you don't get worked up. Hatred makes you do unnecessary work. You see, you're looking. So David, so what? Okay, I'll move him. So all the energy you should use for constructive things, you are using it for destructive things. How can that help you? The weapon of love. So after that, he says, okay, let him be a commander of the army. As he's going, his life will be in danger. But it's the Lord who is with you. And we are so concerned about what people do to us. We make people too powerful in our lives we make people too important in our lives we give people thrones that they should not occupy in our lives and after that he said okay then let him marry my daughter and then we'll see but as he's going to marry my daughter it's all so that it will be a snare and david says okay you give me mary i'll marry her and then he says oh no I will marry her to somebody else. All these are, you have opportunities to be offended by your enemy. So many opportunities. And sometimes it will seem as if the things are escalating. Because Satan will try this, try this, try this, try the different things. One person. And it's like they have opened their hot water shower on you. And it's unrelenting. But in all of this, you must keep your heart. You must keep your love. Your love must not die in the midst of enmity and hatred. Your love must stay alive. Then after that, he says, okay, I, I want him to somehow think that he can be my son-in-law through giving him Michal. When I give him Michal, then he will go and fight the Philistines and then he will die in battle. And he secretly spoke to the servant, speak to David and let him think that I would really like him to be my son-in-law. And the people spoke and David with a pure heart, the Bible says it pleased him. And he said, oh, how, is, it, is it a small thing? How can I be the king's son-in-law? He didn't read into the thing. But if it were you, they didn't give you mera. Major offense. And you have put a major poster and sticker and nomenclature on the person. That this is your name and this is it. And the person will not have a second chance. But when mera was married to somebody else, and Mikael was also brought, David saw it as... Oh, it's a blessing. He said, who am I? A poor man that should marry from the king's house. Who am I? And all that was to link David to kinship. For if you are the king's son-in-law, then you are rightful heir to the throne. Our offenses are supposed to bring us closer to God's destiny for our lives. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is how God works. So go, go and kill the Philistines. And then when he went, he brought the hundred false kings in no time. And the Bible says, and Saul was more afraid. More afraid of David. And do you know, we should believe that God is sovereign. When you believe that God is sovereign and powerful, it will make your enemies less powerful in your life. When you believe that God is the one who has allowed certain things. It will make you be at rest. For if God had not changed the marriage of David from Mirab to Michal, it was Michal that was to save David's life in a few days to come. So when even offense comes, 
See it as the hand of God. See it as something God is doing. Because he has the master plan. And you don't have it. So after the marriage, they are in the room. And Saul says, this time I'm going to kill him directly. And as he sends to kill him, Mikal, who knows about the plot, says, oh, they came to call, go and tell him he's not well. And so they go and say he's not well. And whilst they are doing that, she opens the window. And David jumps out of the window. And she uses goat's hair to make a human being in the bed. So that when the people came, they thought that David was in the bed. But when they tried to kill the person, it wasn't David. It was a dummy. Perhaps your mirror would not have done that for you. And you needed to be offended by your mirror. So that a Mikal will be introduced into your life. But then when Mikal is being introduced, it will be through offense. And it's at the offense stage, you blow it. You say, eh, why did she do this? Why did she? So look, whatever happens to us is raw material for God. Oh, for we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. And to them that are the called of his purpose. If you know, we know. I always say not all things are good. Betrayal is not good. Jealousy is not good. Envy is not good. But that is God's raw material. And we can't choose for him what he should use. Do you know that offense and affliction draws you closer to God? When you see man's betrayal, you say, hey, I better trust something that's constant. I better trust something that never changes. I better trust something that's always there. Hallelujah. So our regrets, our anger, our resentment, our bitterness... They are all just stepping stones to God's destiny. Jo Joseph's brothers, their envy was a stepping stone for his destiny. You say, oh, but God promised that they will bow down to me. How can I be in Egypt where they will never come? He was preparing him. Jo Joseph said, the Lord sent me ahead to preserve posterity. But it will be through betrayal, offense, envy. They've killed you. They hate you so much that your own brothers kill you. And instead of you seeing that it is God who has allowed it and it's for a purpose. You know, the, the ability to rest in his will. The Bible says they that have entered his rest have ceased from their own works. But many of us, we have not entered his rest. And so we are working 16 hours over time. We are working because we have not entered his rest. Hallelujah. Come with me to 1 Samuel 24. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. With love, you will win. Amen. Amen. First Samuel 24. Verse 1. Now it came about when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I'm about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. And it came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him, because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord, that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, since he is the Lord's anointed. And David persuaded his men with these words, and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. Now afterward, David arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, saying, My Lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed his face to the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men? saying behold david seeks to harm you behold this day your eyes have seen that the lord had given you today into my hand in the cave 
And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you and said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Now, my father, see, indeed, see the edge of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you, know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A single flea? The Lord therefore be judged and decide between me and you and me. And may he see and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Now it came about when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, that Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? Then Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have dealt well with me, why I have dealt wickedly with you. And you have declared today that you have done good to me, that the Lord delivered me into your hand, and yet you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safely? May the Lord therefore reward you with good in return for what you have done to me this day. And now I know, behold, and now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. So now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and you will not destroy my name from my father's household. And David swore to Saul. And Saul went to his home and David and his men went up to the stronghold. Amen. Amen. You, if you get your enemy. And it's not that you got him by going to pursue him. You got him that he was coming to pursue you. And then as you were in the recesses of the cave, he came in to relieve himself and guarded as a king. Alone. Access. And your people around you are using spiritual reasons why you should attack him. They say, behold, the Lord has given your enemy into your hand. So what will you do? And David was influenced. That's why he cut off part of Saul's robe. Sometimes you are influenced, so you do things that do not touch the person directly, but you do things that are around the person to destroy the person. You cut a piece of that robe. It was a kingly garment. It was a garment that represented something. And you cut a piece of the reputation. You cut a piece of that thing that the person stands for. And yet your heart does not smite you. But a heart that is pure before God, when you do it, your conscience will speak to you. The Bible says, and David's conscience smote him. Something in your heart will go, mm, this is not it. So David waited when Saul went out. Then he called Saul. My Lord, he prostrated. How many of you can show courtesy to your enemy? And when Saul was coming, he came with 3,000 men. You are in the wilderness, they are in the palace. And the only reason why you are in the wilderness is because of their things. They are pursuing you. And you find your place, yourself in a place where nothing grows. And as you are there, one man... The king of Israel has stopped all that he's doing. You see what hatred does? It distracts you. Offense makes you use fuel and energy in the wrong places. And it lets you leave open areas in your life that you should rather cover. So instead of ruling the nation, going for necessary wars, you have taken 3,000 army to come after one shepherd boy. You even do things that don't make sense. But your hatred is fueling you so you don't even see it. When that happens, David lies prostrate before Saul and said, my father, my lord, my king, that's how he calls him. Why are you coming to pursue me? Is it because of the words of men? And men have a very good way of fueling offense, of fueling pain. You see, many times you have the opportunity to be offended. But the real reason why offense is sent to you is to derail you from where you are going. The woman 
whose daughter was vexed, the Syrophoenician woman who wanted a miracle from Jesus. The disciples said, send her away, for she, make, she troubleth us. She's making noise. Then Jesus said that the bread is for children. It's not for dogs. Some of us will just turn around, forget about the miracle we had come for, and sought Jesus and his disciples out fully. Now, why are you calling me a dog? Small miracle service that I've come from. You are calling me a dog. Me, this church, I won't come again. You have been derailed. What you came for is that your daughter should be healed of demons. But you have been so distracted that now you are facing the disciples, facing embarrassment, using fuel for things you should not use fuel for. And David left God to fight his case. We said, the Lord judged between you and me. And the Lord avenged me of my enemies. Let the Lord plead my case. David was a warrior and a good one. He had killed Goliath. And he could have killed Saul easily. But he did not avenge himself. And he had all the spears and things. Because later, you know, he was protecting Naboth's sheep and his shepherds and all that. So they had weapons of war. He had been given Goliath's sword by a priest before he ran away. So he had the weapons. But instead of that, he chose the weapon of love. You too, you have different weapons in your armory. Words, women, insults. <laughs> defamation, slander and if you publish it, libel those are our weapons and we don't know how to make God fight for us but love says, avenge not yourself, give place to the wrath of God, vengeance is mine and what happens, it induces weeping in Saul and a confession that you are more righteous than I David you are more righteous than I. The enemy who hates you so much and wants to finish you now begins to honor you. Begins to praise you because the weapon of love is at work. Hallelujah. And then he says that I know that you will be king. He begins to prophesy and speak a blessing over you. Which you will not get if you avenge yourself. You fight your own battles. You will not get all these things. But David held a conversation with Saul. He said, my father, why are you pursuing me? Like a flea, one fly in the wilderness. You have come with your whole army to pursue a fly. And flies are not easy to pursue. <laughs> Even when you are pursuing one, you won't know whether it has changed. The second one has come and then now you are pursuing that second one instead of the first. But the weapon of love was at work. Hallelujah. And God is asking for that same weapon to be at work in our lives. That's why he says in Matthew 5, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them that despitefully use you. But many of us, we don't even read this verse. Love your enemies. Love who? But first of all, you have to identify your enemy before you can know that you have to love him because everybody loves their friends, even the world. Do good to them that hate you. You can see that the person hates you like Saul. But you say, instead of doing this, I would rather do you good. Hallelujah. Do good to them that hate you. And then bless them that curse you. And then they that despitefully use you. You see, take advantage of you. They use you anyhow. They do it despitefully. The Bible says pray for them. You have a prayer topic. Instead of talking on the phone, telling everybody, being angry, having the root of bitterness, pray for them that despitefully use you. I'm saying it easily. I know that it's not easy. But I think that it's a more dignified weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> because Paul said, I will show you a more excellent way. A more excellent way. He said, look, if I give my body to be bent and have not love i am nothing and i often wondered hey can somebody give their body to be bent and not have love yes hatred can fuel you 9 11 hatred can fuel you to have your body bent but it's not love amen hatred for humanity hatred for your enemies can make you go and kill yourself and have not love you are nothing you speak with the tongues of angels you are prophetic and spiritual you are great but your own wife in the house, there's no love. Your love is only for in church. Your love is only for the sheep. 
but your neighbor who is nearest to you, there's no love. Love, the weapon of mass destruction. Hallelujah. Amen. And God knows the best way. Philippians 1.9, and I'm ending with that. Sometimes I don't like to share this verse because the people who don't want to walk in love will use this verse as a buffer. And I pray this, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. King James says, I pray that your love will abound in all wisdom and knowledge. Love also operates in wisdom. And some of you who find love difficult say, well, I have to be wise. It's wisdom. It's not, that's not the one I'm saying. But I'm saying that when Saul met David, the Bible says Saul went back to his palace and David went back to the wilderness. When you read 1 Samuel 26, at a point Saul said, oh, return. Return, oh, my son David. But David knew that to return means... I will be killed. So I will do good to you when I have opportunity. But I will not also just leave myself for you to destroy me. Let your love abound in all wisdom and knowledge. Hallelujah. When you have a soul, you recognize the soul. You recognize his deeds. You recognize all that. And you still do him good. But you don't just open up yourself. That soul, just come and destroy me. When you say, come to the palace, then I'll come. When I know that you haven't been cured and you are still looking for me to kill me, I will not come and expose myself to you. Hallelujah. But when I preach that, then the people say, oh, then we have to walk in wisdom. So no more love. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that love operates in wisdom. Sometimes you have to love somebody, but the person has destroyed you with her tongue, what she has said. She's not somebody who is trustworthy. She's somebody who says evil things all the time. So love the person. But don't go and give the person more things about your life. For the person to have fewer to speak. That's not wisdom. Amen. So I'm say, we've broken up. But I have to show him love. Hey, the chemistry. So wisdom and discernment should work. And because of that, love. But love from afar. And I pray that the people of God will be healed in their work of love. Many of us, we don't want to confront the issues. I want to say, oh, me, I'm okay. I'm all right. I'm but let the Holy Spirit reveal to you whether you are okay. For David said, search me, O God. And no more. You search for things only because it's not easy to find. The things that are easy to find, you don't search for them. But when your wardrobe is untidy, that's why you can't find the things. And then you search. Amen. So we need to let the Holy Spirit search our hearts. You will have many, many, many opportunities to be offended. You have many opportunities to be hurt. You have many opportunities not to want to relate to people anymore. But remember that you yourself are not perfect. And just as you feel that people have offended you, you have also offended them one way or the other. And so confirm your love towards them. I pray that you will fight with this weapon in the rest of the days that are ahead. And because the Lord recognizes love, you will win. The Bible says faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest weapon is not faith. The greatest weapon is not hope. The greatest is love. May the greatest stay with you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. Close our eyes. And let's pray. I want us to pray that the Holy Spirit will do a surgery in our hearts. There are some people you have written off completely. God wants to heal you. Your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, the people in the church, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. The Lord is speaking to you. Some of you, you hear, oh, this sermon, love, is not a powerful, the Bible says it's the greatest. And I'm not here to please man, but to please him who sent me. So let love come alive in your heart. The love of God is already shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, if you are a Christian, but you need to let it grow. Love abounds. Love grows. Pray that the love of God will grow in your, in your home. Pray that God will give you grace to have unconditional love for your spouse. A love that doesn't depend on how the person behaves. A love that depends on who God is and how much you love him. I pray for healing in every home. 
I pray for healing in every life, every broken life. I pray for supernatural help for you to be able to walk at the level of love that God has called you to. I pray for help. I pray for healing in your soul. For he said, I, re I will restore your soul. He restoreth my soul. Because your soul, your emotions, your intellect, it goes through so much. But there's restoration in the presence of God. Receive healing. Receive strength. Receive the ability to walk in love. To receive the ability to fight by love. And to overcome by love. Receive the wisdom that comes from above. As your love abounds. In the name of Jesus. Every eye closed and every head bowed. You are here today. You don't know Jesus as your personal savior. You are not sure whether you will go to heaven or hell when you die. You want to say, Lady Pastor, pray for me. I want to be sure. I want to go to heaven when I die. Please pray for me. You are here like that. I want you to just lift up your hands. Forget about everybody next to you or whatever. We all did this to know Jesus. And you too can be a part. You want to say, Lady Pastor, please pray for me. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to be born again. I want to be sure of my destiny. I want to embrace this love. The greatest love of all. The love that never fails. You are like that this morning. I just want you to slip up your hand. And I'll pray for you wherever you are. Come to that unconditional love. Come to that love that never changes. You are here like that this morning. I want you to lift up your hands. And I want to pray with you. Jesus is talking to you. You know who you are. And you know the Lord is beckoning you. If you've lifted your hands, I want you to take another step. I want you to come forward and give your life to the Almighty God and give your life to a greater love. You are here like that this morning. Just come forward and I'll pray with you. I'll meet you and Jesus also will meet you at the foot of the cross. Come to him. Come to the Savior. We are waiting for you. Just come forward and give your life to Jesus Christ. have come you need to get your life straight with God maybe you've accepted Christ before but you need to make a rededication it's not a waste of time I want you to give your life to Jesus I want you to say yes to the Lord the Lord is calling you Father thank you so much for the greatest love of all pray that this love will come alive in our hearts. I pray, oh God, you said that by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. I pray for healing in our various churches. I pray for healing in our homes. I pray for healing in our individual lives. I pray for healing in our relationships. I ask you for a new beginning for your people. In Jesus' name, amen.